it was probably inevitable and only a matter of time before I used <laughs> Star Wars as an introduction. Uh, and certainly a Lord of the Rings introduction is uh, sure to follow um, because those are the things that I know best. But uh, this actually is entirely appropriate uh, for today's message about Joseph. Uh, we will be studying Joseph again this morning, Genesis 42, if you want to turn there. Uh, but these two movie posters, and maybe you have noticed the difference, but there are different. The one on the left is the original, the first release. But it was recalled because the first title of episode six, the uh, third Star Wars movies, was Revenge of the Jedi. But George Lucas, the uh, director and the writer, thought about that and said, I don't like that. I, I don't want it to be revenge because my, my guy's the hero. He's the good guy. He shouldn't be taking revenge. He shouldn't want revenge. So they called all those back and they reissued it and sent it back. It looks just the same. But they changed it to return. Because even when you are battling the dark side, you should not want revenge, was his thought. And I, that made, I thought of that this week because I'm thinking about Joseph. Thinking about all of the things that he has been through because of his brothers till this point. Thirteen years of slavery in prison. That's a lot. That's the kind of thing that would make you want revenge. Does he deserve revenge? We'll think on that this morning, and will he take it when the chance comes? So let's once again look at Genesis chapter 42, beginning with the first four verses. It says, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why don't you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Jacob says to his sons, you need to go down to Egypt because there is a severe famine in the land. And not only in Egypt, but in the surrounding areas as well. And everybody is scrambling to find food, not only to, to feed their flocks and keep them alive, but to feed themselves. It is quite a serious situation. But Egypt, under Joseph's direction over these last uh, seven or over these last years, has had the years of plenty and the years of famine, but they are prepared for these years of famine because they saved up the food. So they not only have enough to feed their own people, but they have some to sell the neighboring peoples as well. And you can imagine that, that under Joseph's obedience to God, Pharaoh, uh, as a byproduct, is getting really rich because he is selling grain to everybody. Now, Benjamin has to stay behind with Jacob. He sends ten sons, but he keeps Benjamin back because after losing Joseph, he has become overly protective of Benjamin. And as far as we can tell, Benjamin's not a kid anymore. He's practically a grown man, if not a grown man of his own, because his brothers all have kids and everything. Even though he's the youngest, he's not a child. But his father is treating him as such because he's the only other son of Rachel. And he is afraid. He's afraid of losing him. You see, whatever affection and whatever favoritism that Joseph's brothers had hoped to wrest away from Joseph when they got rid of him was simply transferred to Benjamin instead. As it always does, does, evil cheats those who hope to profit by it. You never get the reward you seek. So Joseph has his brothers on their way, verses 6 through 17. It says, Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. And as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, by food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You're spies. You've come to see what, that our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were twelve brothers. 
the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Joseph said to them, It's just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison, so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. So Joseph's brothers come down to him and he immediately recognizes them. It was probably easy for him, considering that he's seeing all ten of them at once. So even though time has passed, 13 years, and they have changed somewhat, the group of them are going to be easy to recognize. He, however, is a mystery to them. Because as you know, these have been 13 interesting years for Joseph. He's probably changed physically quite a bit. And we also know that he's now clean-shaven. So he has not the scraggly beard that he had as a youngster when they last saw him. And besides that, they never expect to see their brother alive again. They assume he's dead. So why would they ever see this person before them as their brother? After all, what are the odds of finding their brother again? They must be pretty astronomical. Only if perhaps God has that in mind. Well, Joseph treats them harshly. In that split second, those 13 years of, har of hardship have been reversed. Now he has all of the power. Joseph would have known that he could do whatever he wanted with them. He's second in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh. Nobody is going to care if he does something to a couple of foreigners that come to the land to beg for food. Now remember also that Joseph doesn't know that his brother Reuben tried to plan to save him, that he had a rescue plan in mind before it was foiled. And he doesn't know that Judah spoke up to spare his life. In his mind, they're all equally guilty. Whatever their motive was, they just tossed him in a pit and forgot about him. So what could Joseph have done? He could have said, well, an eye for an eye. You are all going to be slaves now. And, they, and sent them to spend the rest of their lives in slavery. That would have been even for even. Or he could have said, anybody who messes with me gets worse. And he could have had them all executed, given them that dish best served cold as revenge is title. And certainly, no one would have said otherwise. So what emotions and thoughts must have been racing through Joseph's mind? You see, this is a situation that he could never have prepared for. He would have never anticipated that his brothers would show up in Egypt. So as a result, whatever Joseph purposed in his heart before this moment will determine what he does in this moment. So the question is really, has Joseph been harboring anger and hatred and hopes of revenge in his heart? Or has he already forgiven his brothers years ago? The answer is going to determine everything. You see, either that anger has been nurtured and allowed to grow and fester in his heart, or he has dealt with it and laid it aside already. The contents of Joseph's heart are here critical. So let me step aside from the text this moment and ask you a question. Are you holding on to anger? Are you holding on to bitterness of dreams of revenge? Are you waiting for that day when someone who has wronged you will be in your power? Because if you have not forgiven those who have hurt you, you are the one in chains. You are the one that needs to be freed from bondage down. Let's continue with Joseph. Joseph's plan is this. One of you can go home and the rest can stay behind in prison while I find out if your story is true. Choose one and go and bring your brother back and give you three days to think about it. Now I wonder what Joseph mo Joseph's motive is here. Is he planning some elaborate revenge like Edmund Dantes and the Count of Monte Cristo? Is he thinking, aha, I can get all of them down here, I can have my perfect revenge? Or maybe he isn't even sure what to do. Maybe he is using these three days to think about it. What will I do? What should I do about my brothers? I need to test them. I need to find out. Let's look at 18 to 24, chapter 42. 
the text continues. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so your words may be verified, and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why this just that's why this distress has come upon us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now you now we must give an accounting for his blood. They didn't realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then turned back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from uh, from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph changes his mind and changes the test and says, leave one behind and the rest of you may go. Can one, they once again are faced with the opportunity of choosing one of them to face the difficulty and the rest to go free. If they remain the selfish men that they were when he was a young man, Joseph will never see them again. They will choose one unlucky brother and leave him behind the rock. If they have not changed, he will know it. Now knowing each other like they do, would you want to be the one that volunteers to stay behind? You knew, you know your brothers. I wonder how they chose poor Simeon. If he volunteered, he's braver than most of us because he's putting his life in their hands. And they say to themselves, surely we are being punished because of our brother. Now we all know that the first step in repentance is acknowledgement that what you're doing is wrong. Joseph's brothers were well aware that their actions were against the law of God. They knew that they must someday pay a price for their actions. They knew that they had sown the wind and would someday reap the whirlwind. But meanwhile, as they recount the story of the details of his cries for mercy those 13 years ago, how must that have felt to Joseph? It must have brought the whole thing flooding back, all of the emotions, all of the memories, the shock, the fear, the anger, the bitterness, all on him at that moment as his brothers talk about what they did to him. Well, acknowledgement may be step one, but it's not the full way. Then you also have to change your heart. It's one thing to know that you were wrong. It's quite another to regret that you did it. Being upset about the consequences is not the same thing. I often hear people talk about how they're sorry for the consequences of their actions. Not for the action itself, but for the fact that it's had a negative result for them. You need a more fundamental change of heart than that if you're going to repent. And his brothers say, now we must give an accounting for his blood. Reuben politely reminds his brothers that, hey, I tried to stop you guys. It may not be the most constructive remark to make at the moment, uh, but it is correct. It reminds us all and reminds Joseph that this sin was not a fluke. And it is far easier to forgive someone for something they didn't do on purpose to you. Something they didn't mean to do. Or perhaps something that they didn't plan to do. That they just did as a reaction. Something they said in an argument. It's a far more difficult thing to forgive someone who planned to do you harm and carry it out. So it was clear to Reuben that Joseph's blood, and by that they are assuming that he is dead, and now his blood is in the ground crying out to God to take vengeance. How do you atone for such guilt? What do you do? What can you say to make up for a life that you have taken away? There is nothing that his brothers can do to give back to Joseph what they took away from him. They think he's dead. They think he's gone. And all there is left is God's vengeance. So how does Joseph react to all this? <clears throat> he knows that his brothers are aware of their guilt, but he doesn't yet know if they've gone beyond that. Have they changed? 
And while all of this is going on, he is overcome with his emotions. All of those memories, those years in slavery and in prison, all of that time alone without his father, without his family, comes back. That realization also is there that a reconciliation with his brothers might, just might be possible. But only if they have changed. And when you add to that the strain of pretending to be someone you are not, all the while part of Joseph wants to shout out, guys, it's me, Joseph, I'm alive. And there's no wonder that Joseph had to make, take a moment to compose himself. But part of him needs to know the truth. Have they changed or have they not? And so Simeon is left behind. Joseph has Simeon bound in front of their eyes so they can't see the consequences of their actions should they not come back. And now is the test. Will they sell out Simeon to save their own hides and never come back? We pick up the story again in verse 25, 25 through 28. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain to put each man's silver back in his sack and give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain and their donkeys and left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of the sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other, trembling, and said, What is this that God has done to us? Joseph returns the silver. The silver is seen by the brothers as a sign from God that their past guilt is not so easily overcome. There will not be an easy out for what they have done. It has two effects on them. Number one, it deepens the sense amongst the brothers that God is watching, that God will repay. And it also, on the flip side, offers them an excuse. If God really is watching, we really shouldn't come back because nothing good will happen. So it gives them a sense that God is watching, but offers them a convenient excuse should they decide to leave Simeon behind. You see, Joseph wants his brothers to prove themselves once and for all. He needs to know for real what has happened. Either they will rise to the occasion and come back and keep their word, or they will return to the depths from which he last knew them. Skipping ahead to verse 36. They return home and they tell their father about Joseph's requirement that they send Benjamin down. Verse 36. Their father Jacob said to them, You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is, is against me. Then Reuben said to his father, you may put both of my sons to death if I don't bring him back to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he's the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you're taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. So Reuben steps up and makes a promise. He says to Jacob, I will leave my sons back as collateral. You can have my sons. If I don't bring Benjamin back to you alive, you can have them instead and do with them as you will. You can even kill them. You see, to Reuben, the thought of leaving, leaving Simeon in the hot, the thought of leaving, leaving Simeon behind in prison was too much. He remembered that he was unable to save Joseph. He remembered his guilt at having been too slow there. And he will not let it happen again. But Jacob refuses to be persuaded. He says to his sons, if you take Benjamin from me, it will be the death of me. And so they wait. And they do nothing. Meanwhile, poor Simeon, sitting behind in prison in Egypt, saying, uh, guys? Hello? Anybody coming back? Maybe? Huh? What must have been going through that poor man's mind? Skipping ahead, chapter 43, verses 8 and 9. Then Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the boy along with me, and we will go at once, so that we and you and our children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his 
his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I don't bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. You see, the famine continues. Jacob has no choice. Either he is going to have to allow Benjamin to go down to Egypt, or his whole extended family is going to begin to starve. He has no choice. So Judah steps up and reminds him, we must take Benjamin, or we will get nothing. So this is what I will do. You can't hold me personally responsible. As Reuben has already tried to do, now Judah steps up and says, Jacob, I will bear the guilt. If I don't bring him back, I will live with that the rest of my life. It will be on me. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is a little worse today. So what have we seen thus far? We have seen Simeon and we have seen Reuben and we have seen Judah all demonstrate a willingness to put others ahead of themselves. So far nothing from the other seven. And we never do hear anything from the other seven. But the eldest sons at least have proven that they are trying to put their past sins behind them and trying to start anew. Verses 29 to 31 of chapter 43. As he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son, he asked, Is this the young, your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and wept there. <clears throat> and after he had washed his face, he came out, controlling himself, and said, Serve the food. So this reunion, they bring Benjamin down, and the reunion is too much for Joseph. Clearly, he was closest with Benjamin, closest to him in age. They're the two youngest brothers. They have a tight bond. So Joseph has to retreat to a private room. He has to go and compose himself. He must have wanted to end that charade right here and now and embrace Benjamin. It has been 13 years since he saw his brother, and something is still holding him back. To know the truth about his brothers is worth the pain. Because if he is going to have brothers again, not just blood relatives, not just guys that are related to him by blood, but actual brothers, if he is going to have them again, he needs to put the past to rest once and for all. And if Joseph is going to do that, he needs to know the truth about them. Picking it up again in chapter 44, the first four verses. Now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill the men's sacks with as much food as they can carry and put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. Then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest one's sack, along with the silver for the grain. And as and he did as Joseph said. As morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city. When Joseph said to his steward, Go after these men at once, and when you catch them, uh, say to them, Why have you repaid good with evil? Joseph is checking to see if history is going to repeat itself. You see, 13 years ago, his brothers got rid of him because his father favored him best. And now it is clear that Benjamin has taken that place. Joseph knows that. He knows how much his father loved their mother and knows that Benjamin is now the favorite. And so he says, let us see. Let us see if their greed, let us see if their jealousy is gone. And so they put the evidence, as it were, in Benjamin's bag, ready to be discovered to see what will happen. Verse 6. When he caught up with them, he repeated these words to them. But they said to him, Why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do anything like that. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver we found in the mouth of our sacks. So why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If any of your servants is found to have it, he will die. And the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. Very well then, he said. Let it be as you say. Whoever is found to have it will become my slave, and the rest of you will be free from blame. Each of them quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. At this they tore their clothes, then they all loaded their monkeys and returned to the city. Joseph's brothers react with indignation to that 
initial accusation. They go as far as to say, if any of your servants is found to have it, he will die for this theft. And all of us will be slaves. In other words, we know we didn't take it. So I don't care what the punishment is. We didn't do it. You see, nobody protests as loudly as the cheater accused of cheating the one time he's actually playing it straight. The one time the liar tells the truth and nobody believes him is when he gets the most upset. That's the way we are. <clears throat> they also remind Joseph Stewart that, hey, we brought back that silver that was inadvertently put back. We're honest gods. Although in the back of their minds, they must have been remembering how easily it seemed like a judgment from God at the time when they found that silver. And they must be wondering, what now? <laughs> what has God contrived now to catch us for our past sins? Now, interestingly enough, the steward says to them, let it be as you say. But when he repeats the terms back, he actually has lowered them considerably. They said to him, we will, the one that did it will die and we'll all be your slaves. He says, let it be as you say. And he says, oh, but only the one that was guilty will be a slave. And the rest of you can go free. I'm certain that those were Joseph's instructions to his brothers because he wants them to face a choice. No, if they are all in it together, they don't have to choose anything. They're just going to face punishment. But now, they will only be off the hook if they agree to leave Benjamin behind. If they agree to give up on Benjamin, the rest can go free. And so the cup is found in Benjamin's sack. In the process, they go from oldest to youngest to heighten the tension of the moment. And they see, I am innocent. I am innocent, I am innocent, all the way down to Benjamin. And I wonder what the brothers were thinking at that moment. They were thinking, it's going to be in there. <laughs> That's the one. God has punished us, and now we are facing it. When that evidence is found, his brothers face a critical moment. This moment will determine the rest of their lives. How they react to the potential punishment of Benjamin will determine the rest of their lives. Their initial reaction, to tear their clothes is a sign of grief. Well, that's a good start. It gives us some hope. But what will they decide when faced with the decision? Let's look on verse 16 and 17 as Joseph makes the choice for his brothers clear. <clears throat> what can we say to my Lord, Judah replied? What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's kill. We're now, my Lord, slaves. We ourselves and the one who was found to have the cup. But Joseph said, Far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you, go back to your father in peace. The first thing that Judah does is try to change the terms again. He says something similar to the past. Now he doesn't say put him to death, because I don't think he's, he's happy with that term anymore. But he says, we will all be your slaves, all 11 of us. And he says something curious. God has uncovered your, ser covered your servant's guilt. Not on this matter. They know they are innocent of this. They know that this is just God working. But rather on the guilt that has slept all of these years waiting, waiting for God's judgment. Once again it seems clear that Joseph's brothers were aware well of their guilt. They knew their guilt. That Judah is trying to steer the punishment on to just one of them instead of all of them. And that they are resisting that is a good sign. So Joseph insists. He says, you know what? Put it on the one only. And here is the moment of decision. This time, they didn't have to conspire. They didn't have to try to get rid of their father's favorite. It's like they can't help but have their father's favorite taken away. If they are going to be greedy, if they are going to abandon Joseph, here is the opportunity. We can go free if we abandon him. And I love what Joseph says. The rest of you, go back to your father in peace. Really? <laughs> is there any peace in that? Can you go back to your father knowing that Jacob will probably die from the grief of this? Not likely. Can you go back to your father and leave the guilt behind? <laughs> no. So there is no chance of them returning to their father in peace. And here we have the moment of truth. Verses 34, 34. Show us 
that Judah steps up and takes responsibility. As he says to Joseph, So now, if the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the great out of your father, of our father, down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please, let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave, in place of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. Judah has a private word with Joseph. He speaks to him apart, and he says to him, man to man, this is how precarious the situation is. Our father's health is poor. He has already lost one son, the sorrow from another. If I go back without Benjamin, he will die. In essence, I will be responsible for three lives. The first brother, this brother, and my father. Don't make me bear that. Judah pleads with Joseph by telling him, I am also bound by an oath of honor. I have put my honor on the line. And this is something that was taken seriously in the ancient world. If you gave your word on an oath, it was a serious business. Judah is in effect saying, my life is not worth living if I go back without my brother. Don't make me do it. And here is the moment of truth. He says to Joseph, trade him for me. Him for me. Judah demonstrates once and for all that at least he has changed. It was a rather long journey from being a man willing to sell his own brother in an act of jealousy to a man who was willing to take another brother's punishment for the sake of his father. The process of how God worked that out in his heart, as well as in the hearts of Reuben and Simeon, who have demonstrated that similar change, is unknown to us. We don't know what God did over the years to work in these boys' hearts, but the result is clear. Thirteen years ago, his brothers appeared to be vile, selfish men, without any concept of brotherly love. And now today, they have shown that God can change those who are willing to be changed. He can transform guilt and regret into humility and compassion. If God can do it for men such as this, He certainly can do it for you, if you let Him. Let go of your guilt. Let go of your regret and lay it at the cross. Learn humility and compassion for Jesus because He showed us the way. You see, God forgave Reuben and Simeon and Judah and the others. The question that remains for next week is, will Joseph?